Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Lee. In this self-learning module, I'm going to introduce you to the basics of pharmacodynamics. We'll talk about receptors, receptor ligand interactions, and dose-response relationships. Much of what I'm going to talk about in this session is also covered in Chapter 2 of the Katzung and Trevor's Pharmacology Examination and Board Review book. The learning objectives for this session are to find the basic terms used to describe drug receptor interactions and describe the physiochemical factors that determine the affinity of a drug for a receptor. There are many different types of receptors, and in general, the term receptor can refer to a protein that binds to a ligand. For example, ligand-gated ion channels. When an ion channel binds to a ligand, it opens the ion channel and allows ions to move into the cell, resulting in either hyperpolarization or depolarization. The time scale for this event is on the order of milliseconds. A prominent example of a ligand-gated ion channel is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Another type of receptor that we have are G-protein-coupled receptors. Upon binding to a ligand, a G-protein-coupled receptor activates G-proteins, which are small proteins that are associated with the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. Upon activation, these G-proteins can then go on and activate ion channels, resulting in the movement of ions into the cell and membrane potential changes, or they can activate enzymes, which rely on second messengers to propagate a signal leading to intracellular events such as calcium release or phosphorylation. Taken together, these events ultimately lead to changes in cellular physiology. Signaling events associated with G-protein-coupled receptors are on the order of seconds, and an example of a G-protein-coupled receptor is the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Kinase-linked receptors, on the other hand, when bound to ligand, promote phosphorylation of proteins, gene transcription, and protein synthesis. These events generally take hours. An example of a kinase-linked receptor are growth factor receptors. And finally, we have nuclear receptors. In this case, the ligand actually traverses the membrane and makes its way into the nucleus where it binds to a nuclear hormone receptor. This receptor ligand complex can then alter transcription, ultimately altering protein synthesis. This signaling cascade generally takes hours. An example of a nuclear receptor are growth hormone receptors. Therefore, we see the importance of ligands and how they can modulate and mediate signaling cascades by binding to receptors. But I want to challenge your thinking about ligands and ask a simple question. Is a drug a ligand? As we'll see, many drugs act like ligands, either activating or preventing activation of receptors. For example, consider the drug sumatriptan, also known as Imitrex. Sumatriptan is a selective agonist for serotonin receptors, and it's used to abort migraines. So if we compare the structure of serotonin, which is the endogenous neurotransmitter for serotonergic receptors, to that of sumatriptan, we see that indeed drugs can act like ligands. So a receptor then could be defined as the specific component of a cell that binds to a drug or a natural ligand and initiates the biochemical events leading to the physiologic response. A key component of a receptor is the site where the drug or ligand interacts with the receptor, and this is called the binding site. One of the key determinants of this interaction is affinity. The affinity of a drug or a ligand for a receptor binding site is determined by several different factors, including the shape or the three-dimensional structure of the drug or ligand, and the reactivity of the drug or the ligand for the receptor, as well as the types of interactions between the drug or the ligand and the receptor binding site. These types of interactions include ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, van der Waals, and covalent bonds. As mentioned, the shape and three-dimensional structure of drugs also influences the way a drug interacts with the receptor. This brings in the concept of chirality. Because drugs are complex organic molecules, they may exist as enantiomeric pairs. And since the receptor binding pocket requires multiple highly specific interactions, a receptor may discriminate against one enantiomer versus another. For example, let's look at isoproteranol. We see on the left-hand side the L form, or the levorotatory form of isoproteranol, and on the right-hand side the dextrorotatory, or D isoproteranol. 
we see that there are some differences in the way this drug interacts with the receptor binding site. In the case of the L form, we see a hydrogen bond that's not present with deisoproteranol. This actually influences whether the drug is active at the receptor or not. In the case of L isoproteranol, it's fully active at the receptor. In the case of D isoproteranol, it's inactive. So this means that L isoproteranol is an agonist and D isoproteranol is an antagonist. Again, the same drug, just a different enantiomer. So the way this hydroxyl group is oriented around the carbon can actually influence how the drug binds and whether or not it will activate or inactivate the receptor. This idea can translate into clinical utility. Take the example of quinidine. Quinidine is a natural alkaloid that's prepared from cinchona bark, and it's the optical isomer of quinine. Now both of these drugs are effective antimalarial agents. In some parts of the world, quinidine is actually a superior antimalarial agent than quinine. However, quinidine is really considered to be the prototypical antiarrhythmic agent. And we can see their structures here. Again, they're optical isomers or enantiomers of each other, but they have completely different therapeutic utility. So let's bring all this together. Affinity leads to a selective drug receptor interaction, and this in turn leads to a specific effect. For example, nortriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, exerts its therapeutic or antidepressive actions by blocking norepinephrine reuptake transporters on noradrenergic neurons in the CNS. Specific interaction, high affinity for the receptor, in this case it's a reuptake transporter, and this leads to a specific effect. However, many times, but not always, the adverse effect of a drug is due to the drug acting on receptors that are not involved in its therapeutic effect. To go with our previous example, nortriptyline also causes significant cardiovascular effects at clinically relevant doses because it binds and blocks alpha-1 adrenergic receptors on vascular smooth muscle. This is a high affinity interaction. It's very selective for alpha-1, but in this case, it's not a therapeutically useful effect. It's an adverse effect. So the same principles that are guiding the therapeutic use of drugs are also, to a certain degree, guiding adverse effects. So another concept that I want to introduce and talk about for a moment that guides the way that drugs interact with receptors is the law of mass action. The law of mass action states that particles tend to flow from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And I have this graphic here to show the predominant movement of particles in a system. Now you might think, what does this have to do with receptors and ligands, or receptors and drugs? Well, drugs move from an area of high concentration in the bloodstream to the receptor site. And once binding to the receptor, they accumulate to a high concentration on the cell or on the target tissue. And at that point, the kinetics reverse and the high concentration is the tissues and cells, and the drug wants to move away from that site. So the law of mass action really plays a very important role in the way that drug reaches its site of action, and how it reaches its receptors, and also how it's washed away from those receptors to terminate the therapeutic actions, or as we saw with nortriptyline, possibly to terminate an adverse event. So because of advances in modern receptor theory, we understand a little bit more about how drugs interact to produce an effect. We know that drugs need to bind to receptors with high affinity and selectivity, and this yields an effect. And so in this process, we get a drug binding to a receptor, a drug receptor complex, and this is a reversible reaction, and this ultimately leads to an effect. However, there's a little bit more to this than what I'm showing you, and that's that the drug receptor complex has to be in the active form to lead to a maximal effect. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the idea here is very clear. As the concentration of drug increases, the effect increases to a point. So we can drive this reaction forward by increasing the concentration of the drug. So as I mentioned a moment ago, maximal effect is achieved when the receptor is in the active conformation and bound to drug. And we can see that here. The idea is that receptors can exist normally in an inactive state and an active state in the absence of bound ligand or bound drug. And this is just because of thermodynamic changes in the shape of the receptor and that it can be weakly active or weakly inactive. In the presence of a drug or a ligand, if the drug binds to the inactive state of the receptor, there's no effect. If the drug binds to the active state, the active receptor, we get a maximal effect.
There's definitely a lot more to this concept than I want to discuss here, but I think this gives us a nice start on understanding pharmacodynamics and dose-response relationships.